Hey everyone, I'm Menachem Lairfield and this is Zero Percent. Imagine, the team is down by one point. With seconds left to the game, a shooter stands at the free throw line about to shoot the first shot. It goes in and the crowd goes wild. The game is tied up. What makes this even more remarkable is the guy with the ball is blind. That's right, blind, blind from birth, never been able to see. Now you may ask, what on earth is a blind kid doing playing basketball? Because Matt doesn't like to miss anything, especially free throws. Matt Steven, at least at the time of this story, was a teenager who grew up in a suburb of Philadelphia with his two older brothers. He begged his parents year after year to send him to the, quote, normal school. Everything changed when his older brother, Joe, went off to college. He went to Temple University, where he earned his degree in special education. And then Joe came back and got a job teaching in the school that he attended himself several years before. So now with Joe on staff, Matt's parents finally agreed to let him go to the regular school for his senior year. Now, Joe, in addition to his teaching, became the coach of the school's basketball team. During this time, Joe, after school, would take Matt to the local park and teach him how to throw free throws. They would go to the park. Joe would stand by the basket, holding Matt's cane, and Matt would shoot. And wherever Matt would hit, Joe would hit the place that Matt hit if he hit the backboard. Then he would hit the rim And Matt would be able to hear where he shot and how much he was off. And he would correct. And eventually, he started to really hit some shots. And it was then that Joe had this crazy idea. There was a tournament coming up. And he went to the team and he said, if we get permission from the other teams, how would you feel if any time someone on the team gets fouled, instead of the person who got fouled shooting his free throws, what if Matt would shoot those shots. And it was silent in the room until one kid finally raised his hand and said, he can have my shots. And then someone else said he could have mine. Before you know it, unanimous decision, the team agrees. So then Joe goes to the other coaches, the commissioner of the league, the other players, and everyone is in agreement. Everyone says, yes, yes, yes. So the day arrives, it's time for the first game, and someone gets fouled. Matt's mother, who had no idea what the arrangement was, is sitting there in the stands and she sees her son walk out on the court. And she is so confused. What's going on? And Matt shoots and he scores. And unbelievable. The crowd goes wild. She is so proud. And that day he shoots 50% from the free throw line. Better than Shaq. What could be better? Next game, he's not doing so well. Next game, he's missed most of his shots. And... The team is down by one with just 10 seconds left. So the score is 60 to 59, 10 seconds left. The best player on the team, Ryan Haley, the team's best shooter gets fouled. And everyone stops for a moment to think about what's going to happen. Will Ryan Haley, who will most probably make both shots, win the game? Will he let Matt take the shots? And Ryan even says later in the interview that he was actually planning to go to the line and take the shots himself. But then he noticed Matt sitting on the sidelines and he said, a deal is a deal. Matt came to the practices. We had an arrangement. And so he walked over to the sidelines. He took Matt, brought him to the free throw line and handed him the ball. It's silent. You could hear a pin drop. The only sound you can hear is Matt bouncing the ball and the tap, tap, tap of his brother Joe as he taps the rim of the basket. Tap, tap, tap. Matt shoots and he scores. Tie game. Everyone goes nuts. And it's time for the second shot. And Matt, for the first time in his life, feels normal. People on the other team are booing him. They want him to miss. It's great to let Matt take the shots, and it's great to cheer him on, but not when it means losing the game. So he takes the ball, 
drops it once, drops it twice. You hear Joe take the cane again, tap, tap, tap. Matt shoots. Now, before we get to the ending of the story, I want to talk a little bit about the period of time that we're in now, which is known as Sefiras HaOmer, or Counting the Omer. As we mentioned briefly in last week's episode, we count the days from Pesach, Passover, until Shavuos. Counting the days from the holiday that symbolizes the exodus from Egypt all the way until Shavuos, where we received the Torah at Sinai. Incidentally, it's also a time of mourning, at least on a lower level, where we don't have weddings, we don't listen to live music, people don't take haircuts, men don't shave, which is interesting. Like when you ask the average observant Torah Jew, you know, what the idea of Svira conjures up, we think of it as this time of mourning, when the reality is the counting of the Omer itself really has no connection or no overt connection to the mourning. We count the days between Pesach and Shavuos in anticipation, or at least it seems in anticipation of receiving the Torah. What's interesting, first of all, is the name we give for this count. We call it Sfiras HaOmer, the counting of the Omer. The Omer was an offering that was brought on Pesach at the beginning of this process, which seems like a completely irrelevant, not even a side point that has no connection to this count at all. You would think if we're counting from Pesach to Shavuos, we're counting in anticipation of receiving the Torah, we should call this count Sfiras Matan Torah, counting to getting the Torah. Why Sfiras HaOmer? What's also interesting is the way we count. Picture, if you will, Times Square on New Year's Eve. And imagine, instead of the countdown going the normal way, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, we counted up to 10. And we got 8, 9, 10, Happy New Year! It would feel funny. It would be anticlimactic. The same with a rocket ship blasting off into the atmosphere. If we counted up instead of down, it would seem strange because we're so used to the idea of a countdown. You can download apps on the App Store that will help you count down to a special day, a special moment in your life. When it comes to the counting of the Omer, instead of counting down from 49 all the way down to 1, we count up. We start with day 1 and then day 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 all the way until we get to 48, 49. Why are we counting up and not down like we normally do? To answer the question or to ask it a little differently, if the whole point, and we talked about this, I think, two episodes ago, if the whole point of leaving Egypt was to get the Torah, why not just give it to us right away? The answer is clear. It's not that Hashem, the Almighty, wasn't ready to give us the Torah or wasn't willing to give us the Torah. It's that we, the Jewish people, were not ready to receive it. When I count down to something, whether it's a vacation or a trip or a promotion or my wedding, I'm counting down to something that I'm excited about. I'm anticipating. What I really say when I'm counting down is I'm at point A. I am looking forward to point B. And as far as I'm concerned, everything in the middle, I wish it just disappeared. I wish I was there already. I want to get rid of all the time between point A and point B. That is not what we're doing with the counting of the Omer. This count is just as the Jewish people were not ready to receive the Torah when they left Egypt. And they had to work on themselves, becoming better and better people, building these spiritual floors, the spiritual levels to ascend day after day until they were ready to receive the Torah. That is exactly what we do during this period of time. We spend seven weeks, 49 days, working on ourselves and building ourselves up. That's why we don't count down. We count up. Every day when I count, I'm not just counting. I'm making the day count. I'm saying, look at the spiritual floors that I have built. Not I have eight floors left to go. But I built two floors. Look at what I've accomplished. Look what I've created. Look at what I've built in myself. That's also why we call the count the counting of the Omer. 
The Omer is made out of barley, which in biblical times, although I love mushroom barley soup, my wife makes a killer mushroom barley soup, but in biblical times, barley was considered animal fodder. Human beings, people did not eat barley. They ate wheat. And when you look at the offerings at the beginning of this process and the end of the process, the beginning of the process is the Omer. It's barley. It's animal food. Whereas at the end of the process, we bring a offering on Shavuos made out of chita, made out of wheat. And the idea is that when I begin this process of counting the Omer, and I look forward to the person that I will become at the end of this process, I say, compared to where I am going, right now I am nothing more than an animal. Not to belittle who I am right now, not to belittle the progress I've made throughout my life, but an awareness and a recognition that I still have so much further to go. The journey is just beginning. That's the nature of a journey. The nature of a journey is a recognition that there is always more to the process. I'm never done. I'm never complete. I'm never finished. And so we spend this time working on ourselves, building ourselves up. We count seven weeks of seven days. The reason for that is that the number seven represents wholeness and completion. Six is the plain physical world. Eight is the metaphysical, the supernatural. And seven is the transition between the two. It's the threshold about to be at the spiritual. It's the idea of the physical world in its fullness. In Jewish mysticism, when we look at the number seven, it's not an independent number of itself. It's really the core of the six. It's taking the, if you look at any physical matter, it has six sides, up, down, top, bottom, back, forward. When I do this in person in classes, I bring magnetiles because this really confuses people for some reason. And I show them six magnetiles and how we build them together to make a cube. A cube has six sides, and that's true with all physical matter. Simple physical matter has six sides, and seven is the core, the expansion of that six. It's interesting if you take six things of equal size, let's say you take six apples, those six apples will fit exactly around a seventh in the circle. Meaning if you put the six so that they're touching each other, there's exactly room for one more in the middle. That is the seventh, the central point, the core within everything else. So the seventh is actually the center, the focus of the other six. That's the idea of Shabbat, which maybe we'll have an episode talking about in the future. But that's what seven represents. That's why we have seven days in the week, seven oceans, seven continents, seven heavens, seven colors in the color spectrum, seven notes in the music scale. The number seven represents that physical world in its completion. The idea of like music, that each thing is building upon the other until we get to the crescendo, we get to the symphony, which is the holiday of Shavuos receiving the Torah. What's interesting is that we don't count the 50th day. We don't count the day itself where we receive the Torah. We count up until the 50th day. We don't count only to 49. And I think the reason why is this growth mindset concept that we focus on the journey. We focus on the process, not the product, not the end. This 49-day process of growth, this 49-day transformation is like life a journey. It's a process. And it's a process where I count every single day, day by day, recognizing and looking back on what I've accomplished today to become a better person. I focus on the journey. I focus on the small steps, not just at the end result. So these are important days, days of growth and building oneself. But they shouldn't inherently be days that are sad so where did the concept of mourning during Sphiris Omer come from? So that comes from the idea that we talked about a little bit last week. The Rabbi Akiva, the great sage, had 24,000 students. And those 24,000 students all died during this period of time. The Talmud says that the reason why they died of this plague is because they did not afford each other the proper honor. Now, these were the greatest sages alive at the time. Obviously, they were not giving each other wedgies in the hallway and, you know, being rude to each other. 
So when we say that they didn't afford each other the proper honor, we have to understand that this is a very nuanced idea. Here are people, especially at this time of year when they are working to perfect themselves, who were all so consumed with self-perfection that they failed to appreciate the uniqueness, the importance of their friends, of their colleagues. And when it comes to the transmission of Torah, it's not enough to study Torah. We have to live it. And these were the links in the transmission. These were the links that were going to give Torah over to the next generation. And their living of Torah had to be perfect. And so they perished during this time. And that's why we have this period of mourning. Now that answer might satisfy you. You may be okay with that until you stop and think about the fact that really in Judaism, we don't have even one day in the calendar mourning the death of anyone else. So why would we have over a month of mourning for these students? Generally speaking, in Judaism, we mourn someone for a week, maybe a month, maybe a year. When the year's over, even when the anniversary of their death comes back and we celebrate a yard site, it's a celebration. It's a celebration of that person's life. It's not mourning. So why do we mourn the students of Rabbi Akiva? And the answer is we don't mourn them. What we mourn is that which they could have brought to the world, but they weren't able to. The students of Rabbi Akiva died prematurely, which means there's so much more they could have done. And the world today is a sadder, darker, emptier place as a result. Matt made those two shots. When we look to find a hero of that story, Matt is incredible. Ryan Haley, who lets him take the shots as a teenager to give up that spotlight, is also remarkable. But the true hero of the story is his brother, Joe. The person who was willing to see what no one else saw. He saw the potential in his brother that Matt himself couldn't see. And that's what the counting of the Omer is all about. It's about recognizing that every single person is unique. Every single person has something of value that I can learn from, that the world needs. The students of Rabbi Akiva fail to see the greatness in their colleagues. And we make up for that with our mourning. We remember the fact that the most important thing we can do during this period of time as we work on ourselves to become better people is to look and see the greatness in the people around me. The students die because they didn't see the potential. We mourn the loss of potential in this time of recognizing the potential. <laughs>